Good, uh, good morning and welcome to this uh, definitive edition or presentation on lockdown. My name is Pete Leroux and I represent the Business for Ending Lockdown campaign. Without any further ado, uh, I'll hand over to Nick Hudson. Uh, Nick, very thank you very much for hard, the hard work and the great work you've been doing to bring light to a very confusing situation that has cost us much over the past six months. Nick Hudson. Thank you very much, Pitt, and good morning to all the viewers and to my uh, fellow speakers. Um, I'm going to plow straight into it, and I have one request for all of the listeners, and that is that I would like you to forget everything you know about coronavirus, everything you think you know about coronavirus, I should say. And I will uh, warn you in advance, there are some uh, surprising and for some people disturbing uh, findings in our work here. Um, so get ready for a bit of a ride. <clears throat> the key points that Panda has been making over the last four or five months are as follows. That first of all, the coronavirus impact, as it was modeled and projected by various organizations all over the world, um, was completely uh, overestimated. The second one is that when we came when it came time for south africa to enter its epidemic we failed to ignore to take cognizance of all the international experience that was around by then and uh, as a result our government's advisors uh, got the whole pattern of the epidemic not only its magnitude but also its duration completely wrong we contend from the from the start that the economic and mortality impact of lockdown was not being uh, fully recognized or even recognized at all. The conversation at the start when lockdown was extremely popular, if you remember, was that um, this was a question of trading lives for, the, for money or lives for the economy and how could anybody do that? But we brought it to everybody's attention that the economy simply mediates life. So when you shatter an economy, you find yourself in the domain of playing the game of trading lives for lives. And then our later work also found that the lockdown benefits are non-existent. And I, I say that without qualification because our more recent work has even shown that then lockdowns may exacerbate uh, coronavirus mortality. Our story starts in February with this boat, the Diamond Princess. It was a tragic story. Here was a boat with a, a deadly virus uh, storming around it. The Japanese authorities wouldn't even let the boat dock initially. So scared were they that the virus would make landfall on their territory. Um, but if you look past the, the headlines and the, the, the tragic story, what this boat represented was what we call a petri dish, an opportunity to see how the virus will evolve in a closed population. And, you know, this is a very fortunate position to be in as a scientist, to be able to look at this information. It may take you years after the virus has gone around the real world to work out exactly how it behaves. But here you had a population of 3,700 people, and it took them 15 days to do anything in terms of lockdown, social distancing, all that kind of thing. So we got a really good look at how this virus was going to behave. When I say we, I'm talking about the people who initially formed Panda and I would say a handful of researchers in the rest of the world. The mainstream epidemiologists had their attention firmly focused on China and they were buying into the whole Chinese story of lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. And what this book told us is that this disease was actually not a particularly severe disease. In particular, it didn't affect anybody on the boat under the age of 65, even though the very large crew complement of some 2,000, I think, people um, did, 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 did have no ability to isolate. They were living in um, quite dense bunk room accommodations and so on. 
So we learned quickly, this is not a disease that affects young people. And we also got a clear view of the mortality for older people. Only 12 people out of the 3,700 on board died, uh, despite um, you know, the, the virus have, having had enough time to go all the way around that boat. Uh, and many showed no symptoms, the majority showed no symptoms when they were infected. So you got a clear picture of a disease that was mild for most people and had a fairly low mortality rate. And you could infer from that experience on the boat what it would look like on dry land in real countries. You did that by simply adjusting the age-based mortality on the boat for the population age structure of a country. It's not a very difficult calculation. You can do it in a little spreadsheet. And we did this and produced a series of numbers called the Diamond Princess numbers. And our estimate of that uh, uh, for, for South Africa uh, was 20,000 deaths might result, which sounds like a lot when you just roll it off the tongue like this, but in the context of a country that experiences on, on average 450,000 deaths a year, uh, and typically somewhere between 10 and 20,000 deaths from the flu, it didn't sound like a particularly bad story. And um, <clears throat> we were very surprised therefore to hear the World Health Organization come out with a completely different read. We call this tweet the costliest misrepresentation in world history. Both sentences in this tweet are correct. The first sentence, globally about 3.4% of reported coronavirus cases have died. Correct. By comparison, seasonal flu generally kills far flu fewer than 1% of those infected. Also correct, and indeed most people think it's about 0.1%. But by conflating cases with infections, Tedros was misleading the world in a very severe fashion. Cases represent those people who are infected, who are, who are sick enough to arrive at a hospital, whereas infections include a vast majority of people who don't uh, go anywhere near a hospital. You know, if you've had flu before, it will very seldom have taken you to hospital. Um, and by making this conflation between the 3.4% and the flu, which has a 0.1% mortality rate, a lot of people heard this as meaning that coronavirus was 34 times as deadly as the flu. flu. And all over the world, people punched in the po world population of about 8 billion people and multiplied it by 3.4% and concluded that tens of millions of people would die. Along with that came this message, which we've all come to loathe, the message, test, test, test. Further fuel was added to this fire on the 16th of March, um, pretty much ending life as we know it, really, when Professor Neil Ferguson at the Imperial College produced a model that predicted that as many as half a million people would die in the UK and 2.2 million people in the US. Massive overestimates, more than an order of magnitude. Now, Ferguson had been implicated in prediction of six epidemics that failed to materialize, including the foot and mouth outbreak in the UK that led to uh, an extraordinary number of uh, animals being put down and you know devastation in the agricultural sector there. There were farmers committing suicide. It was a terrible scene and it was all for nothing. Similarly with the swine flu panic. Why we listened to the guy this time around, I don't know, but the whole world did and what ensued was lockdown all over the place. And this is where the story gets really strange and I'm pretty sure that this is new information for you. I'll draw your attention first to the bottom paper here. In the New England Journal of Medicine, none other than Anthony Fauci, the high priest of lockdown panic in the United States, produced a paper in which he concluded that the consequences of coronavirus may ultimately be more akin to those of a severe seasonal flu, which has a case fatality rate of approximately 0.1%. And similarly, at the same time, or roughly the same time, week before, the UK government concluded that having studied the disease, the mortality rates for coronavirus were low overall and came to the conclusion that it should no longer be categorized as a high consequence infectious disease. These are stunning revelations for most people. Why the panic? If leading authorities 
in the discipline of epidemiology had already concluded in March that we were correct in our interpretation of the diamond princess information and this disease, that this disease was not the deadly killer it was thought to be. In the same way that the UK had its Ferguson, we had our modelers in South Africa and they were quick to produce the same kind of bad science, predicting as many as 351,000 deaths in South Africa. Um, it took a long time, several months for the world to produce that many deaths and South Africa only has 1% of the world's population. And we believe that when confronted with this information and along with the news that that might result in a shortage of as many as a million hospital beds, uh, Ramaphosa's path was set and the state of disaster and lockdown followed. All of this was helped along with a great deal of panic in the media. You've all seen headlines like this, including scare tactics around children, you know, which is truly ridiculous. The mortality rate for children from coronavirus is virtually zero. So confronted with South Africa's lockdown and then after three weeks, its extension, um, the group of people that by then had formed Panda felt that they needed to do something. We saw in lockdown an existential crisis for the country and indeed for life as we know it all over the world. Yet the lockdown was still incredibly popular. Uh, everybody thought that it was fantastic what leadership the president was uh, demonstrating for the first time since his inauguration. And we were looking at this thing with horror. So we approached the exercise by producing a paper that attempted to quantify the loss of life that might stem from lockdown. And we tried to do it in a way that favored the argument for lost lockdown. Notwithstanding that, we came to the conclusion that lockdown would cause a loss of life at least 30 times greater than the loss of life it stood to, present, to prevent. And that we did with standard actuarial techniques that are used to price insurance policies all over the world and that have been used for better part of 100 years. Very standard actuarial techniques. Now, just by way of a little preparation for the slides that are to come, I just want to uh, highlight a couple of features here because there's a lot of conversation that takes place about deaths and cases and infections, and we need to be clear what we're talking about. So this is a schematic. It doesn't represent any particular country. It's kind of an, an average for a seriously affected country. And what we show here, if you look in the bottom right-hand corner there, there's a tiny block which represents deaths. That is approximately 300 per million is the number that you should compare if you're used to looking at the, the stats online. 0.03% of the population will die from coronavirus. And the cases, which you read about all the time, will represent approximately 1% of the population. Okay? And you can see there the case fatality of approximately 3%, 0.03 over 1%. But that's a small part of a much bigger picture. Wherever antibody tests have been done on a randomized basis anywhere in the world, so Sweden, New York, India, many, many countries now, we get this finding that approximately 20% of the population will demonstrate uh, the presence of antibodies, suggesting that they've been infected. And so that group is obviously much bigger than the number of cases, you know, in most countries, anywhere between six times and 200 times the size of the, the number of, uh, ordinary, uh, of official cases or confirmed cases. But there's yet another group, um, which are people who, once they become infected, don't go on to generate antibodies. The infection is so mild that they only generate what's known as a cellular immune reaction or a T cell reaction. That's in response to a topical infection. So maybe something in the upper respiratory tract, a sore throat or, or, or so. And they may not even notice the infection or it may be so mild that they just can't believe that they've got coronavirus. Um, and that's a bigger group, or so we think at the moment, than the zero positive people or the people who have a serious enough disease to go on and produce antibodies. And so... You, you know, this number of 30% could even be much bigger, by the way. It could, could be that as many as 80% of the population get exposed to the virus and don't develop an antibody response, just literally bounce it off them using their normal cellular immune reaction. But depending on how you define the infected grade, uh, group, you get vastly different uh, fatality rates, as you can see on the top right there. The case fatality rate of 3% is representation of the people who arrive ill at hospital, 0.03%. 
And the other groups are dependent on how exactly you define the infected population. But you see there, they're all fractions of 1% and maybe even fractions of 0.1%. So this news that you hear about South Africa ranking sixth in case numbers, yeah, it's true. Um, but first of all, we're 13th in terms of deaths, number of deaths. And of course, you need to standardize by the size of the population. So deaths per uh, million of population, we rank 23rd. But if you look back to that slide, what's the meaning of that? Okay, what does it mean that we rank 23rd? Well, here we can see how South Africa stack, stacks up against other countries. 23rd in the, in the world. Our estimate of 10 to 20,000 deaths derived from the Diamond Princess analysis and a scrutiny of overseas experience would put us exactly in the range where we are um, compared to, say, Peru and Belgium, which occupy the first two places that both have more than 800 deaths per million. South Africa is sitting at just over 200 deaths per million. Now, government's models have had a model in place since May, which they updated and then withdrew the update, so the May model still stands. They're predicting 40 to 50,000 deaths in South Africa, never updated, okay? That would put us in line with the worst countries in the world. And there's a good reason why to expect that we wouldn't be in line with the worst countries in the world, and that is we have a much younger, younger population. And you will remember that I pointed out that this is a disease that fundamentally affects the old people much more than it affects the youth. Indeed, South Africa has an a, a, a old population about 20 or 25 percent the size of that of Belgium, and even half that the size of, Bel of Brazil. So that gives us a, a lot of reason to expect that South Africa would produce lower ultimate mortality than a nation like Belgium. The other thing we noticed from quite an early stage was that there was a massive disparity in global experience. This was very much an epidemic of the Americas and then Northwestern and Southern Europe. Um, the rest of the world has an, a combined average fatality rate here, population fatality rate of approximately 25 or 30 per million, which doesn't even reach the threshold for describing it as an epidemic. There are some countries, I think there's three countries that have not yet had a death from coronavirus. And that's very strange. It's implausible that they never had an infected person walk on their soil. This is a disease that has spread around the world. There are no countries that, uh, well, barring a few very remote islands, there are no countries that haven't had a coronavirus case. So we decided that a better way to approach the mortality and to understanding the impact on the country would, instead of just building a model um, using assumptions that we've plucked out of the sky for South Africa, uh, we would look and try and understand what the causes of this different mortality were. And we came up with a not too surprising finding that the three main uh, issues were how old is your population and how much comorbidity do you have in the population and how much obesity do you have in the population. B obesity is an independent factor. But now for the bad news. When we put lockdown into that model to see if that made a difference, and we use a, 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 a data series called the Oxford uh, lockdown stringency index, we found that there was no relationship. That chart on the right is the relationship between the stringency of lockdown and the deaths per million of a country. There is no relationship. That is a statistical paint splat of no relevance. Lockdown does not determine how many people die, neither does it determine how long it takes to get to your peak. In other words, there was no curve flattening effect that we could see. And given that the whole purpose of lockdown had ostensibly been to flatten the curve and give hospitals time to prepare, this we found quite an astonishing finding. It surprised us. Just to illustrate again, if you don't like statistics and scatter plots, this is a chart that a little, uh, a little animation with uh, average deaths per million on the, on the x-axis. So in other words, how hard a country is hit by coronavirus. And on the y-axis, an estimate of the lockdown stringency in that country. And this is how it evolves over the weeks. 
then he goes straight to the front, social distance, mustering some speed on the inside, it's thank God they're still racing, after it's gone in the early part, stock up on toilet paper and racing very keen in the early stages, is wash your hands, Jeffrey, a couple of lengths away, then the golf is an exercise from quick, get on a settle, if you settle, get the order. Okay, and if you're seeing in that bad, whoopsie, sorry, if you're seeing in that bad news for countries that didn't lock down, well, I'm, I'd be very surprised. Another surprising thing for most people is that prior to coronavirus, the science was unanimous. You can find all over the place in the World Health Organization, at the U.S. Center for Disease Control, in any number of epidemiological journals, this opinion that Quarantines, which is the word that we used for before coronavirus for lockdown, quarantines should be eliminated from serious consideration, that the effects are so severe that they should never be contemplated, that schools should not be closed in response to influenza epidemics, that screening and quarantining of passengers will not substantially delay virus introduction, and even that masks outside of hospital settings accomplish little, if anything. So there's a hell of a lot of science before coronavirus, and we ask, why did it all change? Another way of looking at this is if you drill down into the South African experience. Here's Cape Town, the southern suburbs at the top, and Kaya at the bottom. And the obvious difference between these two places is that, whereas the wealthy are very able to socially distance, um, the poor in Kaya are not. And what do you see there? Very similar pattern on the way up in terms of how the infection uh, penetrates the community and then a faster route down in the community that's least able to socially distance. Again, just suggesting that lockdown doesn't have an effect. And yet what does the World Health Organization, uh, organization say, the, the organization that set off the stampede and the panic? They say that you shouldn't release your lockdown until your health systems are able to detect, test, isolate, and treat every case and trace every contact. And five other conditions, none of which we believe are possible. So here's the organization that put us into lockdown, telling us not to leave it. Onto the models. We, we, I'm not going to make too much of this. Our models are available on our website, but we have managed to set up very simple models that have described this epidemic uh, to a T, if you look at this Western Cape one, which is the most progressive uh, story, you'll see that we're actually on the dot uh, relative to our estimate, which we made in 10 June. And from those models, we were also able to reach reasonably accurate resource estimates. Um, there's a lot of virtue in this kind of simplicity that we use. We don't, we don't get complicated and try to model every probability on every transmission probability and everybody's infection. We look at the overseas experience, what are the patterns that we're seeing, and we fit very simple curves and project them. And we can do that quite early on. Um, and there's a lot of virtue to that simplicity because you can change the models very easily. And this is how this pans out. On the 12th of June, the SA um, Coronavirus Modeling Consortium issued a model. And that model, uh, we took one look at it. We were hoping that they were going to moderate their, their May uh, model. And we were very disappointed, despite the massive confidence intervals that they were projecting over the course of the next month and a half. Um, they were still forecasting a tragedy of epic proportions compared to what we were seeing. And so we sent them immediately on the day for the first time publishing one of our models, our Western Cape curve, which you can see in the bottom right. Now, uh, that, that curve has such narrow uh, confidence intervals that you can barely see the, the, the curve behind the actual numbers, which are those red dots that emerged over the course of the next month. And we at the same time predicted that the NRCD's model would be breached. The lower confidence interval would be breached on the 13th of July. We were wrong by a day. It breached on the 12th. And compared to that, this model of ours, which is still in place and to this day in some, what is it, uh, two, uh, two and a half months later, is still tracking down its center line. Um, you know, a huge just in us breach of scientific method, a application of bad science by the authorities. And there goes the, the, the May model in its full context being breached um, by the actual deaths. That's the previous model of the consortium. But more seriously, I mean, what is the use of estimating deaths? Surely you are trying to estimate hospital resources. And this is what that picture looks like. It's even worse. 
beds and ICU beds were overestimated by these models, even by their, their most optimistic cases, in a range of 13 to 29 times too much. And the result of that is the same thing we've seen elsewhere in the world, massive, massive misallocation of resources. A six-month lease was just signed by the Western Cape government on a facility in Brackengate. Uh, just as we proposed that herd immunity had been reached in the Western Cape, that facility will barely be used. And it wasn't government that was the only person doing these crazy modeling exercises. Business for South Africa came out on, on, uh, roughly on the day that South Africa peaked, predicting that there was a, to be a surge in cases and mortalities that would continue until late August. Couldn't have been more wrong and more unfortunately timed. So let's put these, this more moderate epidemic in context. At 14,000 odd deaths at the moment in South Africa, this ranks below low respiratory infections, normal uh, death rates for the year, and way below the death rates from other causes of communicable diseases like HIV. Um, South Africa has 450,000 deaths a year in the time that coronavirus has been around with us some 250,000 people have died in South Africa. So perspective is really needed. Similarly, on a world scale, only 2% of the deaths in the world this year have been around coronavirus, and that's probably a dramatic overestimate. The, the official cases we feel include many deaths that aren't really caused by coronavirus. And you can see there that you know, by the end of the year, this won't even be in the top 10 of causes of death worldwide. On the other hand, and this is what I'm going to hand over to my colleagues to talk to you about, the lockdown has been deadly. Um, and headlines like this are starting to become part of our everyday reading material. This one in particular is gutting. UNICEF estimating that lockdown will kill more than coronavirus-19 as it predicts 1.2 million infant deaths. Just before I hand over to the guys, I want to address a serious question. All of these authorities who predicted disaster are embarrassed right now. And with the deaths not coming, they are all indulging in an absolute epidemic of scaremongering. You will have heard of second waves being spoken about on your televisions and radios. Ignore. This is what a second wave looks like. Belgium and France, a rash of testing amongst young and asymptomatic people, giving rise to lots of new cases. But as you can see on the bottom of those charts, no deaths. And there are other scaremongering tactics, long-term effects, um, which have been only uh, seen in a handful of uh, small groups of people with no attempt made to rule out pre-existing conditions. This business of getting reinfected. Now, the two cases that have been found were both asymptomatic, which in a normal uh, English use of the term, Immunity suggests that the people are immune. They're, they, if, the, if exposed to the virus again, if the virus penetrates their cells, they don't get sick from it. So you do not need to be worried about reinfection. And all over the world, governments are beginning to realize that they, we are paying now for what has in fact not been an epidemic of coronavirus, but an epidemic of stupidity. So we anticipate that our original estimate that 14 million years of lost life will ensue from lockdown, that that estimate is still intact. We think that our government is going to struggle to raise money. We think that the academy, academia, is going to be fighting over these issues for years to come and that there's going to be a lot of institutional fallout. 